and thank everyone. Oops, here we go. I'll start now. So good afternoon. Um, we would like to welcome and thank everyone for joining us today for the Faculty Speaker Series presentation. I am joined today by my colleagues, Dr. Liz Gatchel, Dr. Jill Cargo, and right beside me here, Dr. Danielle Peterman. Um, today we're going to review our clinical process, the Clinical Improvement Project. It is also known as CLIP. You'll hear that throughout the presentation. And we've implemented this clinical process over the last several years here at the Altoona campus. Um, as we go through this presentation, you will see that the underlying goal of this whole clinical process is to promote and strengthen clinical reasoning among our nursing students. Oh. <clears throat> Good. All right, just need to read um, this disclosure statement. All right, so attendance at this activity can earn one contact hour through Penn State Ross and Carol Neese College of Nursing. To receive one contact hour, you must attend the full program and complete the evaluation provided at the end of the program. Penn State Ross and Carol Neese College of Nursing is approved with distinction as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by Pennsylvania State Nurses Association an accredited approval by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission and Accreditation. The topic of this education is non-clinical and therefore we did not identify, mitigate, or disclose relevant financial relationships. All right. So just kind of reviewing our objectives here briefly, um, following this, the learner will be able to uh, recognize the importance of promoting clinical reasoning and judgment among nursing students. And we will provide some research data to support the idea for the need to promote clinical raising activities in the clinical, the classroom, and simulation. Learners will also be able to describe the process of CLIP implementation, including the various tools that we utilize, activities, and evaluations utilized with the CLIP process. We welcome any questions or comments during the presentation. You can send a, us a message through the chat messenger box, um, but we will also entertain questions at the end of the program. All right, so to begin our discussions, uh, we wanna focus on some of the driving forces and rationale of why we decided to transform our clinical process, which is the research data that we have found related to the professional gap that transition from nursing education to practice. So one of the first like research studies that we did find to really initiate this was from Kavanaugh and Swazita. They completed a study between 2011 and 2015 of about 5,000 new grads from 140 schools in 21 states. And they found, as you can see here, only 24% of new RN graduates met entry-level expectations uh, for clinical judgment. So when, you know, the National Council looks at those entry-level characteristics, usually it's, you know, includes but not limited to some limited confidence, critical thinking, and, you know, clinical judgment, and delivery of client care in an efficient manner. Now, Kavanaugh and Sharpnack repeated the above study that we just talked about, very similar study with 5,000 um, new grad participants. And in this latest data collection between 2016 and 2020, they found that only 14% of new grad RNs actually demonstrated entry-level competency. And then the most recent data from Kavanaugh and Sharpnack, they completed some data in 2020 that indicates only 9% of new graduates actually meet the competency range for a novice nurse. So this data pattern does suggest we are continuing to lose ground in preparedness of new graduate RNs at a time when it is needed the most. And one of the biggest recommendations of the research to reduce the educational gap was that academia and practice must work together as a system to really support um, student success. So with NextGen on the horizon at the time and data indicating this professional gap, faculty here at Altoona, Penn State Altoona 
did decide to develop a committee to improve the clinical process. And that committee is called the CLIP Committee, which still does exist. And it was formed in spring of 2017. So the purpose was to transform clinical nursing education by promoting clinical reasoning and judgment, like we've talked about, but also in real time while reducing the burden of the written assignments outside of clinical. So in developing this process, we did move from more of a traditional clinical process, which involved usually pre, you know, during clinical and post-clinical work, both on the student's part and faculty part, to more of a process which focused on real time, you know, completing think activities, clinical reasoning activities during the clinical time and providing immediate feedback. Now, at the time when we developed um, like this committee, we realized that this transformation would not only assist the nursing students in building a foundation for their nursing careers and practice, but would also help prepare them for the NCLEX next gen at that particular time. So, you know, now we're just going to start to get into the clinical, um, the CLIP development and implementation. So this is just kind of an outline. We'll get into more detail of the different tools that we have used. But again, as I mentioned, the CLIP committee began in 2017 with implementation in 2018. Um, tools were developed, um, evaluation tools, um, the various CLIP tools and processes to help guide with the main purpose in mind of improving clinical reasoning and judgment. To promote consistency, there are identified instructions for both faculty and students in each of the tools. And then standardized clinical reasoning questions are utilized by faculty for instructor to student discussions during that clinical time. So you will see that, um, and we'll talk about it later here, that the weekly instructor clinical performance guide and notes evaluation tool really promote, has all of the different questions um, that are standardized for faculty to use to, you know, um, during clinical to ask students. Um, all clinical preparation tools and evaluations, again, are completed during the clinical day. So there are real-time activities with no pre or post assessment worker activities. So for example, when students complete their concept map or clinical like client plan of care, which we're gonna be discussing shortly, they will um, complete portions of that concept map throughout the clinical day and then discuss it with their, with their instructors towards the end of the day. And it's kind of nice, I know for myself and a lot of others, we will pull up the patient's EHR and we'll go over those discussion questions and then they can make connections you know, with the information. Um, students, again, receive immediate faculty feedback. So, you know, in the traditional process, oftentimes, you know, we would spend hours checking that paperwork um, on the weekends, and oftentimes they would not even get that feedback for at least a week. And oftentimes there was a disconnect, you know, trying to remember their patient and what they had completed, but they get immediate feedback with this particular process in real time. And the other thing is, the objectives from the Ross and Carol Neese College of Nursing clinical evalu evaluation tools are aligned with the clinical tools and activities. And you will see that in the upcoming slides. We'll show you an example of that. Okay, so I'm gonna discuss a little bit about um, some of the tools that we use in the clinical setting with students. Um, before I get into that though, um, a couple things. As we were developing this committee um, on our campus, we felt that it was incredibly important that all faculty were on board with this uh, for consistency among not only us, but certainly with students. So they understood what their expectations were and it was being carried throughout all the courses. Um, there is a course co coordinator process that we had developed um, in which the course coordinator meets with all the clinical faculty at the beginning of the course um, to relay clinical expectations and, and ensure um, that the objectives for the course are very clear. In addition, the course coordinator has um, the role of deciding which, which tools are used in which course and how they are actually implemented throughout that course. Um, and I'll explain a little bit more about that as we go. <clears throat> 
Um, all documentation and template templates and the communications are all within a Canvas master course. So all faculty on campus has access or within the nursing department has access to these tools and can use those for their particular course. And some of those templates, um, overall, they are really like I said, used consistently throughout courses, but some of them get adjusted very slightly depending on a specialty. You know, for OB, for example, that may have needed to be adjusted ever so slightly just because of the objectives looking a little bit different in that course. Um, the CLIP process was also communicated to healthcare facilities. We felt that was very important as well, that our um, healthcare partners knew that we were going to be uh, changing how we did clinical a little bit. Um, I we were kind of feeling like um, when we would go in, you know, they were they were asking us to do a lot of skills, and certainly skills are important. But really, what Clip was about was focusing on that clinical judgment, and that was how we were going to be approaching clinical. Um, so skills, yes, but really clinical judgment. So it was important to us that the facilities knew that we were going to change those processes a little bit. And then finally, um, we decided that it was important that we were going to be explaining really to students what clinical judgment was. So um, we adopted the uh, Linda Caputi Think Like a Nurse text, and we teach clinical judgment and reasoning and what that really means and the importance of clinical judgment and reasoning in nursing to all students coming into 250. So the G-Nurse students get it in their first semester, as do our second degree students. So um, <clears throat> this is an example, it's just a, a little snippet. It's not the entire report sheet guide, but this is our report sheet guide and our preclinical questions. Um, the report sheet guide is required for students at the 200 level. As students move through the program, um, get to the three and 400 level, um, if they are able to, you know, just answer these or know that this stuff in their head, they don't have to actually fill out this form um, and, and turn it into us. But this gives the 200 level students as they're just entering clinical an idea of really what information do they need to gather from the EHR. Um, and then the preclinical questions, and you can see those four preclinical questions at the bottom. We ask every student those four preclinical questions before they go in and take care of their patient. And really what this is assessing is, are they safe? Are they safe to go in and take care of that patient? Um, you know, initially. And then, of course, throughout the day, we continue to guide them through questioning and so forth. Um, but these four questions we use consistently in all of our courses. This is um, the concept map that we use. Christine mentioned about the concept map. Um, it looks wordy on here and there is a lot on here. Um, the concept map as well, um, as, we, as we move students through the program, if they can verbalize this information to us in later courses, they don't have to fill this out and hand it in. Um, as Christine mentioned, we do, we're doing all of this in real time. So those discussions that we have with students and their verbalization of this information, um, you know, that's what they'll do when they get out into the real world as a nurse. We want them to be able to learn how to do that without necessarily writing it down and us then hand correcting it. So, um, but as they start, they, they certainly need this tool. Um, and then, you know, moving forward, they don't necessarily need it. Another thing about the concept map is that it's not done every week. Um, so, it's a lot to discuss these concept maps with students, um, to have eight or nine students and try to go through concept maps. Um, it, it takes a lot of time. Um, so they don't necessarily do this every week. If they can do one for us satisfactory or two, um, then you know we're happy with that. Uh, and again, this is up to the course coordinator to decide how they lay this out, you know, if they're going to have one of these do a, a semester or a course, or if they're going to have two of them, and, and when the student will do them, that's all up to the course coordinator. In addition to the report sheet guide and the concept map, we have some additional activities also that we do with students or have students do. Um, the faculty all felt very strongly about continuing to have students write a head to tone nurse's note. Um, yes, EHRs are certainly, you know, out there, probably in the majority of clinical settings, but we felt that um, having them write the nurse's note was 
just really important so they could really put together and, and paint a clear picture of what that patient looked like, um, as well as document it in a head to toe format. So they may do a nurse's note once or twice, or maybe more than that a semester. And again, that's up to the course coordinator. Um, they also will certainly do focused assessments and we often have them do a head to toe assessment that is in, uh, instructor observed. So the instructor actually goes in with the student and watches them do a head to toe set assessment and then um, has a discussion with the student about how they felt it went um, and gave them, you know, gives them some some guidance on how they could maybe make improvements next time they do that head to toe assessment. And then in addition, as I said, we adopted the Caputi uh, Think Like a Nurse um, textbook. Uh, there's think activities that we have students do. And um, they do different ones throughout different courses. Those activities range from entry level up to more advanced for um, higher level students. So they'll usually do a think activity, maybe two um, a semester to, to um, just change their thinking and really get them thinking a little more critically. Um, an example of one of those activities is compare and contrast. So they may be assigned um, to do a compare and contrast activity on two patients with congestive heart failure. And then they would have to decide what's the same, what's different, and not only the same and different, but why things look similar and why they look different among those two patients. And then in post-conference, we still do a, a typical post-conference, um, and that can include various activities. They might be sharing their clinical day, what they did, what they learned. They may be sharing their concept map. They may be sharing their clinical think activities. Um, sometimes we have them actually do a handoff report where they do an SBAR report and handoff to their peers or to us um, to, to learn how to give shift report. So, and, and there's other things that we do in post-conference, that's not all inclusive, but those were some of the big ones that we do with students. So as we were putting together this CLIP committee um, and these CLIP processes, we felt that we needed some sort of timeline or some sort of way to organize how we were gonna manage this among students. Um, and this is shared with the students as are all of these documents. So they have full access to everything. Um, but this is kind of just, a, and this is a snippet as well, our clinical day generally goes longer than noon, um, but this gives you an idea of how we kind of manage our timeline through the day. So as you can see, somewhere between 6 and 7 a.m., the students will start filling out their report sheet guide, they look in the, the patient's EHR, um, and they will then Know, discuss um, anything on the report sheet guide as well as those preclinical questions, those four preclinical questions with their clinical instructor. Between 7 and 7.30, they'll get report from the RN. And then we ask students to come give us that report um, after they get it. So they'll come to us, they'll give us report. We'll make sure that, again, that they are safe to go in um, to take care of that patient. Maybe something had changed since they looked in the EHR and then they got report from the nurse. Um, and then the students will begin their clinical day. Um, between eight and 10, you know, we're usually uh, busy with med administration. The students are busy with med administration. Um, and then any other activities that they were assigned for that day. Uh, and they'll continue those things through 10 and 11 o'clock. And as you can see at the bottom here of each of these boxes, we're, ha we're having check-ins with students throughout the day. So we kind of can keep an eye on what they're doing and where they are and, and just making sure that they're managing their time properly and getting things done that they need to, um, to get done. And then you can see between 11 and 12 is lunch. And we send half of our students to lunch while the other half remains on the unit covering the patient's that of the students who have gone to lunch. Um, and then the afternoon, you know, they, they will continue um, finishing up on whatever activities they were assigned. And then we also have post-conference as well. And now Liz is going to discuss um, the evaluation of these tools, how we evaluate students um, using these tools. And she's also gonna dis uh, discuss how we've brought CLIP into the lab and simulation settings. All right. So yeah, to talk about evaluation, this is probably one of my personal favorite parts about this because as um, Danielle and Christine kind of talked about, it allows us to evaluate the students throughout the day the way we've developed this process. So they get formative and summative evaluation. Um, I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. And um, what's really nice about the documents that we have um, developed is that the expectations are known. 
uh, both for faculty and for students. So it helps a lot with our adjuncts too to have a guide and know exactly what we want them to be asking students. And then again, we always tell students it's not a secret. They have access to the questions. They know what we're going to be asking. Um, which leads me to transparency and fairness. So it's, again, they know exactly what we're going to ask. So they're able to prepare um, in any way that they need to, whether it's writing it down or being ready to verbally discuss. Um, we also feel that our process allows us to provide better, um, better safety and quality care to our patients. Again, because we are evaluating them throughout the day we can stop them before they form a wrong thought process, but also before they make a mistake caring for the patient. Um, and then, of course, the whole goal here is to promote that critical thinking and critical judgment um, and these processes of kind of always checking in with them and, again, evaluating uh, their thinking throughout the day allows us to help them develop those skills. Uh, next slide, Danielle. Sorry, I forgot I had to tell you. Okay, um, really important to note that when we went about this process, we did look at the College of Nursing um, clinical evaluation, and we aligned everything that we do with the clinical objectives. When we are evaluating students and um, unfortunately have to put somebody on a remediation plan or they have a needs improvement, um, we do go back to these objectives to make sure that we're using one aligned with the, um, the activity that they are showing the behavior in or the, the, the uh, deficiency in. Um, <clears throat> we can, uh, we look at levels too, I'm sorry. We look at levels too. So starting from uh, the 200 level to the 400 level, we did recognize too that there should be a difference in what our expectation is. Um, so we do look at our 200 level students from a more basic um, you know, set of standards than we do the 400 level. Um, and again, aligning with the College of Nursing evaluations helps us do that as well. Um, when we developed all of our evaluation tools, we also made sure we were using a common language. So the College of Nursing evaluations use pass, needs improvement, and fail. All of our evaluation tools use the same language so that there's no confusion between faculty and students of what their performance means. All right, next slide. Okay, so two of the documents that we use on a weekly basis are the Instructor Clinical Performance Guide and Notes, which I know is a mouthful, uh, and then the Weekly Clinical Performance Evaluation. So, uh, actually, I think, Danielle, I'm going to go to the next slide because it's a little easier to look at it and talk. Okay, <clears throat> so this is the um, Weekly Instructor Clinical Performance Guide and Notes. These are the um, set of questions that we use to evaluate the, um, our students. Now you'll notice that these first four questions are the preclinical questions that we talked about earlier. Um, this document in its full uh, length, it ends up being about six to eight pages, uh, but it has the questions listed out exactly as seen here. Um, some of us have developed little shorter versions of this as we get used to it. We don't need the full question. Um, to answer it, and we have kind of like a note-taking page that makes it more manageable on the clinical unit. Um, <clears throat> so what's nice about this is, again, the students have it, but we're also able to evaluate their responses on all the activities that they do. So we did talk a little bit earlier about how um, students traditionally would submit a care plan, and we would get to it a few days later. We would make annotated notes um, that we weren't really sure they were reading all of the time, and then we would see the same mistakes going forward. The other thing that we saw frequently is that students would form an incorrect thought process about a disease um, or a treatment that the patient was receiving, and then we had to undo sort of that thought process that they already had. Um, and a lot of the times that was very difficult. We would often see the same mistakes over and over again. I do feel we have eliminated some of that by being able to interrupt that, um, that thought process and put it on the right track um, rather than do it later. Okay, go ahead, Daniel. Um, yeah, thank you, okay. 
Um, then the weekly clinical performance evaluation, um, we use this every week just to show students where they're at. Um, it promotes a discussion from us, usually first thing in the morning to say, um, you passed the pre-conference, right? Or those preclinical questions, you passed your med administration. Um, and hopefully, right, they have P's all the way down and we both initial, the instructor and the student. And if it didn't go that way, it also provides us the opportunity to have the conversation about where they need to improve. If we need to put the student on a remediation plan, this is the time to have the conversation. Um, or if they're already on a remediation plan, to have the discussion early on in the morning about what the expectation is and what we're hoping to see from them that day. Um, this weekly evaluation helps immensely <laughs> in making sure that students know where they stand in clinical, whereas uh, prior, when we were just doing a midterm and a final evaluation, um, I don't think it was as clear to students about where they stood. Um, okay, go ahead, Daniel. All right, so some additional things that we do. Uh, we are bringing case studies into the classroom and using some other kind of clinical reasoning activities, and then we have brought it into the sim lab. Um, so in the classroom, sometimes when we bring those case studies in, we will use their preclinical questions just like they use in clinical, so that it gives them some transference uh, and they're able to sort of apply it in a different setting. Um, as far as the lab goes, what we have started to do in um, health assessment, uh, Danielle and Tracy have started to use case study where we actually turn the mannequins on and they do health assessment um, with a case study. It is very basic. Uh, we're not expecting them to do uh, you know, the things that we would expect from a 230 student, uh, but it is just getting them to start thinking about what they're hearing and why they might be hearing it if they're listening to lung sounds um, and trying to connect some of what their health assessment skills to what's going on with the patient. Um, we use the preclinical questions before we start simulation. So we do have the students um, get into the EHRs and learn about the patients, and then we ask them the preclinical questions just like we do in actual clinical before they go into the sim. It prepares them uh, to start thinking about the disease process. It doesn't tip them off about sim. I know that's, that was a concern. It doesn't really necessarily give them um, a heads up about what might happen in the simulation, but it at least gets them thinking about the disease process so they can make good decisions while they're in the simulation. Um, some faculty have also started to have them complete concept maps, just a general concept map on the patient too prior to coming to clinical. So they already have an idea, again, what the treatments are, what they should be looking for. Uh, we've also implemented what's called the clinical pause, uh, which might be my favorite part. Uh, so just like we do in clinical, where they're going down the wrong path and they're forming that incorrect thought process, we also do this in sim. So if they are stuck and they've been standing talking for three minutes and they're really not um, getting anywhere, we will kind of pause, um, not give them the answers, but step in and ask them some uh, critical thinking questions to try to get them on the right track. Um, We'll also pause before they make a really, really big mistake. Um, we'll also stop them if we see something incredibly unsafe, just so that they don't ever uh, remember that incorrectly um, and do it again. <clears throat> um, and then in debriefing, we do use concept mapping to debrief them. So we will take the disease process, talk about what they did, and try to help them connect um, the rights and wrongs of what they did and why it would make sense for that patient. Um, the thinking activities are um, integrated into 250 and some of the other courses moving forward, and those are Linda Caputi's. So it gets the students started uh, very early on in working on those um, clinical judgment and critical thinking. Um, using next gen questions. So a lot of us incorporate those into our class. And that has um, proven to help, I think, especially as we start to add them to our um, exams, we're seeing 
uh, more confidence in our students and answering these questions and they're, they seem to have uh, better thought processes. And then virtual reality is, is newer, um, but we are <clears throat> um, definitely working on clinical reasoning and clinical judgment when we use virtual reality. Um, they are the only one in the scenario. So very much like when we were doing um, the V sims and things like that online, they were the ones making the decision. Um, the only thing different about VR is that they are immersed in it. It feels like they are actually in the room with the patient making the decision. So it is a little more of an intense experience. Um, okay, that's it, Joe. Okay, and to end, we're going to talk a little bit about our future activities that we are um, incorporating with CLIP. And as Christine said in the beginning, um, we continue to have a CLIP committee. We continue to meet um, because we want to make sure that what we're doing is still current with what the National Council State Board of Nursing, NextGen, NCLEX, to make sure that we're providing our students with the best clinical reasoning experience that we can we can give them. So um, a couple of things that we are doing is we are looking at Socratic questioning um, that aligns with the National Council State Board of Nursing Clinical Judgment Measurement Model. Um, we are also reviewing that with um, ATI, Socratic questioning, which I did um, already go. And the next couple slides, I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. Um, the other thing that we are hoping to do and are working on is that we want to make our documents electronic. Right now, they are all paper pencil, um, which is a little old fashioned when we're trying to get with the times here with everything else we're doing. So we are looking at how um, and we're trying to implement this so that it is an electronic version of it. OK, next slide, Danielle. So um, I'm sure everybody has seen this by now. Um, the top line there are the six functions of clinical judgment that are from the National Council State Board of Nursing. And those are um, designed to um, allow students to arrive at competency with clinical judgment. Um, the bottom row is the nursing process, which we have been teaching um, forever, um, but they actually align very nicely. Um, if you look at the recognizing cues, that's very much our assessment piece of the nursing process. So um, when I get to the next um, couple of slides, you're going to see what questions we ask about recognizing cues. Um, analyzing cues, what does it mean? Okay, that's very much our analysis phase, um, which long time ago was diagnosing phase. So all these terms are changing, but we're keeping up with the current times. Um, prioritize hypotheses and um, generate solutions kind of go with our planning phase. Um, then we have take action, which is our implementation. What will we do? And then the final is our evaluate outcomes, which is the evaluation slide. Um, and what we found, and I'm going to go to the next slide, Danielle, but what we found is we were actually very happy whenever we were looking at this because a lot of these questions we've already been doing. So when we developed this process and then we saw ATI came out with the Socratic questioning, which is up right now, we ask our students a lot of those questions that are already promoting their um, clinical judgment and reasoning. So um, we were very happy to see, see that we were on the right track with what we have been, been doing, and it couldn't have been more perfect timing with um, the upcoming next gen NCLEX, which is in full force now. So um, we were we were pleased with those results. But when you look at these questions, okay, um, a lot of these are already, if you saw the full model, if you saw all the questions that we ask our students, you would see that a lot of these questions on here are the ones that are incorporated with our weekly guide and notes. And um, like Danielle and Christine said too, and Liz is our adjuncts really like this too, because it gives them a guide. And what our, what our goal is that we're all doing the same thing and all of our students are getting the same experience. Now we know we can't clone each other and they're gonna have different experiences by different units and what their goals and focuses are, but it really does um, make sure that we are focusing on clinical reasoning and judgment with our students. So just for example, our recognizing cues, um, what is your priority assessment finding? Um, why did you identify that data as relevant? Um, what are the trends in clients' vital signs? So we have them look at their vital signs. Are there any changes from what they are? What do those trends mean? 
Um, we ask them analyzing cues. Um, and we are looking at what we're doing right now too is we're incorporating, we're making sure that what we have on here in this ATI process is what we are truly asking our students. And a lot of it is the same. So um, that is part of our future though planning is to make sure that this is correctly implemented. So you can see down through there, analyzing cues, asking different questions, prioritize hypotheses. What is the greatest risk to the client today? We have generating solutions, okay? What nursing interventions are indicated? And we've always taught them to think like assess, do, and teach. What are you assessing on your patient? What are you doing for your patient? And what do you need to teach? So um, we are working to continue to make sure that we are supporting what the Socratic questionings that there are available to them. Same with taking actions and evaluating outcomes. You can go to the next slide. So in summary, um, the CLIP process is intended to improve students' clinical reasoning and reduce the educa education to practice gap, which we saw only 9% of our students, according to the latest research, are meeting entry-level expectations. So um, like we said before, that's something that that is not the um, new employer's responsibility that Lynn leans itself back to education a lot too. So we need to work together and find a way to better prepare and make sure that our students and future nurses are ready to practice. Um, the other thing that we do is we have collected some data with our senior level nursing students. We send out a Qualtrics survey in their senior year to evaluate the process and how it helped their clinical reasoning. Um, in the very beginning, when the students completed the traditional model um, with the pre-assessing the night before, doing all the paperwork, that feedback, we had a little comparison of um, what they thought of that. And it, the process has been very, very positive. Um, they they like the immediate feedback. They like going over the EHR with the faculty member right there, giving them guidance as to where they go. So we continue to um, incorporate a survey with our senior level nursing students and hope to prepare and have the best tools that we can to prepare their clinical reasoning and judgment. So what we wanna do now is I'm sure everybody is doing something to promote clinical reasoning and judgment. So we want to know um, what are you currently using? What do you do for your clinicals to promote clinical reasoning and judgment? And is there anything um, that we talked about today or anything that you think that you could use to modify or incorporate or further incorporate to build on that clinical reasoning and judgment experience? Okay, so I am going to actually um, kind of just uh assign breakout rooms and you guys can discuss um, with whoever is in your breakout room, just those questions that Jill um, had mentioned there. Um, and then we'll bring everybody back for uh, discussion. And if anybody is um, willing to share maybe what they use and if there's anything that they might be able to modify to incorporate, further incorporate cl clinical reasoning and judgment, we'd love to hear that. Um, and then if there were any additional questions, um, certainly we can uh, address those too. Um, so I will, I'm going to go ahead and put you in breakout rooms, uh, for discussion and then we'll, we'll take like maybe five minutes or so for discussion in breakout rooms and then we'll all come, I'll bring everybody back. Okay. All right. You should be getting, um, invitations to, to go into your rooms. Can you, are we going are you um you yeah we can here? we can if you <laughs> yeah that's what we were just looking at that's why i can't move so many Maybe because
Okay. Okay, I think we have just about everybody back. Um, so uh, would anybody, is anybody willing to share what was discussed in the breakout rooms or did you have any suggestions or uh, things that you're currently doing that you'd like to share? Uh, for, this is Jen Kashadi. Hi everybody. Um, we, our group, we had a really, really good discussion on what um, some of the other uh, campuses use. Um, I thought it was really, really helpful uh, with some of them, especially when you're limited on um, a post-conference, especially uh, in the clinical that I set, that I have a lot of times we're so busy towards um, the time for post-conference. So there was a couple like alternative ideas that they could actually do um, after clinical uh, to kind of respond to that clinical judgment if there wasn't enough time. So that was really helpful. Great, thank you. Anyone else? I'm curious what um, Becky's clinical judgment cards are from the chat. I wasn't in her breakout room, not to put you on the spot, but I am very curious. No problem. They are a set of cards that I found online and I've kind of added to. They basically are like, once the student will be like, okay, I've assessed my patient, I've done my concept map. And um, sometimes, you know, they need something else to do. I will have them pull a card from my deck and they say things like, um, your patient just told you they're now experiencing chest pain or your patient's potassium level just came back at 6.2. And so they have to, even though they've already kind of developed their plan for the day, they have to think about how does that change their plan? Because we know that at any time our patient can decompensate and things can change, or we found something that we weren't initially looking for. So it makes them kind of think outside of what they just planned and also making them kind of have that adaptability to if something changes, these priorities are going to change. That's great, thank you. Any others? I have a question, Danielle, but I don't know if we're going, is there's a part for that? That's okay, you can, go ahead, Mike. So I guess it'll go to Jill, I'm not positive though. So do you require this book in 250 and then they keep the, I think it's yes, and then they keep this book throughout their whole entire time, the Caputi book in the curriculum, yep. that's correct, right? Right, yeah, Daniel, that's correct. put it on our required text for 250, um, so that way they can access these documents or use, or use the activities the whole way throughout the program. And we tell them they need to buy it so that they have it for every course upcoming. If they only buy it, and are you using an ebook to get with the times, or are you still using the, if there is even one, are you using the hard copy book? We're still using the hard copy. I don't know if there even is an e-book for Caputi, to be yeah. honest with you. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, I, but we're still using the hard copy. And actually, we just let them write right in the hard copy. So they bring yeah. it with them to clinical or to class or, you know, to the lab, um, depending on what we're doing. And we just have them write right. And if I remember, it's reasonable. Like, it's not super expensive, the book. It was, oh boy, the last I, I, I was, uh, it, it wasn't terrible. 60-ish? Yeah, think. I was going to say it's, it's. Above 50, but be definitely <laughs> below 100. I would say yeah. around 60. I think yeah. that is very reasonable in today's world. Thank you, guys. Great job, and thanks for sharing this info. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? And I see Kelly in the chat hat. Are we going to ask the clinical leaders who hire our students if they see any improvement? And I think that would be very neat to do, um, except for we're going to have employers all over the place. So, I mean, I guess that's definitely something we should probably look into. Yeah, that's what Christine and I were just talking about it as well. I, that's a great idea. I would like mm -hmm. to see what I they I would love to see that what too, they think. What they, if it makes a difference. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say, I don't know if you're going to ask that, need to ask that specifically, or if you can just look at the um, Oh my goodness, I can't remember the name, the SIPR and the information that's collected by employers like six months and a year um, after the students graduate. Right. Yeah, that's a great point, Mary Alice. Mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't think about that, but yes, definitely. Any other questions, comments, anything else anyone would like to share? Okay. 
Okay, I'm just going to share our references um, for you. Um, and just one other um, thing we we have, I mean, anybody is welcome to use these documents. We're happy to give access or um, if you think of questions afterwards, we're happy to answer them. You're welcome to email any one of us um, and we can hopefully answer those questions or at least direct you, direct you to, to find the answer. Um, but the documents we have all, you know, anybody is willing or welcome to use those. So please just let us know. Kelly had one more question in the chat there, Daniel. Oh, sure. Um, Kelly, we didn't collect any data as far as simulation. We kind of um, just carried this over as a clinical factor into simulation. So I don't know if we have anything specific to implementing CLIP and simulation um, as of right now. Uh, we get, uh, we do surveys for simulation, but um, I could probably try to compare pre-implementation uh, to now and see if there's any differences, how reliable they would be. And I, I see Ray mentioned that employer feedback is very low. Um, so yeah, that's something else that we would have to consider as far as you know, really how how good that data might be if we are getting any data from from employers but yeah. and just to add on about the sim question the students mm -hmm. only know this process for us so it it i think helps to streamline the concept between sim and real clinical um, where it's all real clinical and it's not something new or different um, so that consistency um, throughout all that we do clinical related because sim is part of clinical makes a huge difference in that. And as we mentioned too, we're bringing it, we're even trying to bring sim into the, or sim clinical, I guess, more so into the classroom um, in, in doing cases and doing mini, I don't even know if you could call them simulations, but just, just bringing cases into the classroom and, and trying to incorporate some of these think activities in the, this thinking process in the classroom as well to, to really try to kind of blur the lines, I guess, between class and clinical. We want them to transfer that theory into the clinical setting and, and them to recognize that these really aren't two distinct areas. They need to be using things in both, you know, those thought processes in both theory and in clinical. And they probably heard us say, what are your major concerns about this <laughs> patient and <laughs> what complications should we be looking for a million times from first level to the whole way, sophomores to seniors. Yeah. yeah. They become very familiar with it once they, once they, you know, are, are seniors, they just kind of already know how to answer. They don't, they don't even need to wait for us to ask. They know how to answer it. So. Yeah. And just having gone through like the traditional process and this clip process over the years um, and based off of our faculty and students surveys, I know their perspectives but both faculty and students definitely have seen changes, you know, and I think a lot has to do to not just promoting that clinical reasoning, but getting the real time feedback. I think that really is really important. Yep. Any last questions or comments? Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thing. Yeah. Yep. Thank you guys Thank for you. attending. We appreciate it. And we do. We have um, the survey um, so to complete and get your one contact hour. So if um, Darcy did place it in the chat. So if everyone wants to take the time to go ahead and complete that, so get your credit. Thank you again, everyone. Thank have a good you, week. Everyone. Take care.